Good morning, everyone. Wow, I have not done a PowerPoint lecture in a long time since when I was teaching at a medical school about two years ago. So this is this is really exciting. So welcome. I'm so excited that you're here. Today we are talking about alpha thalassemia. And before we get started, I did want to introduce myself in case we haven't met virtually. My name is Dr. Natalie Chomek, but please call me Natalie, and I'm a pathologist. My story starts at Florida State University where I got my MD, and then I decided to become a pathologist. And so I packed up all my things, moved to New York City. I did an anatomic and clinical pathology residency at Mount Sinai, and that was four years. And then I stayed there and did two more fellowships. The first one was in gastrointestinal and liver pathology. And then the second fellowship, which was actually a surprise, was hemepath. And after that, I got a job at a Boston hospital and I became an attending. And it was a university hospital, so there were residents and fellows and medical students, and I got to teach them all, and it was a lot of fun. And what ended up happening is I kind of wanted to change things up. I really loved teaching, but I wasn't doing a lot of it in my last job. And so I wanted to teach more full time. And I decided to start this production company, basically. And I want to create lots of videos that I wish I had in medical school with lots and lots of visuals. And so here we are, and I'm glad you're here. Another surprise along the way <laughs> is that I became a 3D artist, and that kind of came out of nowhere. Um, I started learning in 2021. I have quite a bit to go. There's a lot more classes and YouTube tutorials to take, but all of the renderings that you see here, like anything in 3D, I made that. And it's just how I see things when I was learning and teaching residents, fellows, medical students. So I hope you like them as well. I love lectures. I love giving them. I love sitting in them, especially when they're really, really good. But I don't like many surprises. I like to know where we're going in a lecture. So I do want to give you a map for where we're going with all of these slides. So part one is going to take us from blood to hemoglobin. Part two is going to be normal hemoglobin. Part three is when we have a problem with hemoglobin, and that's where we talk about alpha thalassemia. Part four, we're going to talk about the genetics of alpha thalassemia. And part five is going to be my acknowledgments, because every time I create something or make it, it's not just me and sometimes it's someone close to me or sometimes it's someone from TikTok who teaches me something or inspires me to make a video. So sometimes the acknowledgements are anonymous, but I do like to acknowledge the people that make all of these videos possible. So let's get started. Hello from Future Editing Natalie. So this lecture was a lot of fun, but it turned out to be much longer than expected. So I'm gonna break this up into two separate videos. The first one that you're watching right now is gonna cover parts one and two, and then the second video, which I'll upload later, is gonna cover parts three, four, and five. I love blood, so that is why I have anointed myself the Heme Queen. I am playing around with my logo, and so I'm thinking about this blood drop with a crown, with a smile on my face. Let me know what you think, but here we go. So blood, we have about five liters floating around in our body right now. And sometimes I like to put things in perspective by giving a commonplace example, like an everyday example. And when you think about those two liter bottles of soda, when you put it in that context, we have about two and a half of those large bottles of Pepsi or Coke, um, that amount in our bodies of blood. <laughs> And within that blood, we have a lot of red blood cells. We have 25 trillion red blood cells floating around in our body. When I was a fourth year resident on my first day of my hematology rotation, I looked at red blood cells truly for the first time under the microscope. Like I'd seen them in textbooks and lectures and things like that, but this was the first time I actually held the slide and like put it under the microscope. I have to admit, I was really bored by the red blood cells because 
They were all the same shape. They had this circular shape. They were all red and just red. They weren't pretty with granules or anything like that, like a white blood cell. And they were all pretty much the same size and shape, so they looked kind of boring, kind of monotonous. Well, it's been quite a few years since then, and I have decided that the red blood cell is truly fascinating. So here it is up close. I do put these little uh, heme queens in my images if I don't have a laser pointer. So if we look at the cell from the side, which is close to the left-hand side, our teal-colored heme queen, you see that there's actually an indent in the center. So this red blood cell is disc-shaped with smooth edges, but the center indents towards itself. So we have this biconcave disc shape. So it's not as boring as I thought it once was. And you can see this also on the um, near the gray heme queen. Um, you can see the indent happening. And this is actually really important in terms of how the red blood cell performs its job, but we're not going to talk about the cytoskeleton today. Hereditary spherocytosis is coming up very, very soon, so we'll talk about it then. But what I wanted to show you is this red blood cell is not boring at all. It is called a red blood cell. It's also known as an erythrocyte. Erythro meaning red in Greek and cyte meaning cell in Greek. So you put that together, you get erythrocyte. And sometimes you have them referred to as corpuscles or tiny bodies. So these red little bodies, these red corpuscles, these are quite fascinating and we're gonna focus on them here today. If we took a tube of blood here and we didn't let it clot and we put it in a centrifuge that spun it super, 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 super fast, the components of the blood would actually separate out. The heaviest items would fall to the bottom and then the lightest things would get to the top. And that's what we have right here. So at the bottom, we have our red blood cells. We have a lot of them and they're packed to the bottom of this uh, test tube. In the middle, we have this buffy coat and that's where our white blood cells and our platelets are. And then up at the top, we have this clearish yellowish plasma and that's gonna be the lightest part of our blood. The bottom with our red blood cells that are totally packed and smushed together, that's known as our hematocrit. And as we go through this lecture, uh, I'm gonna sprinkle in some lab values and lab tests for you. So the first one is already here, and this is the space that these red blood cells take up in this tube after you've spun it down. And this is given as a percent. For men, it's 41 to 50%. For women, it's 38 to 48%, but I like something a little simpler to remember, so I tend to remember 40 to 50%. The buffy coat is 1%, and then plasma is about 55%. Suppose we take a very, very juicy drop of blood. Uh, by juicy, I mean 50 microliters. <laughs> if we took 1 50th of that juicy drop, meaning one microliter, and we zoomed in on it and we measured all the red blood cells that were in there, we would get a number that is 5 million per microliter. So that is your next lab value, which is the red blood cell count. And this is automated. It's counted by a machine and it measures how many red blood cells in millions are there per microliter, meaning that 1 50th of that juicy droplet. Now I remember five million because it's easy to remember, but we do have some um, more exact ranges. For men, we have 4.4 to 5.7 million red blood cells per microliter, and then for women, it's 3.9 to 5.1. And then the last thing, we talked about the number, we've talked about the shape, uh, we've talked about measuring red blood cells, so now it's time to talk about their color and what I once thought was a very boring color, but it's definitely not. Hemoglobin is what makes up red blood cells. A red blood cell is essentially 95% hemoglobin. If we wanted to think of it this way, the red blood cell is essentially a bag of hemoglobin. So here's what hemoglobin in my mind, in my renderings, looks like. We have hundreds of millions of hemoglobin molecules in a single cell. And that hemoglobin has the extraordinarily important job of picking up, carrying, and delivering oxygen throughout the body. So what it does is when it's in a high oxygen area, let's say in the lungs, um, because the air we breathe is full of oxygen, 
that hemoglobin will grab that oxygen, hang on to it, and then eventually deliver it to all the other parts of the body that are away from the lungs. So the entire body is oxygenated thanks to hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is red, so the red hemoglobin is what makes red blood cells red, and then red blood cells are what make blood red. And if you remember the shape of the red blood cell with that that was a biconcave disc, that center is thinner than the edges, so less hemoglobin is going to be in that center area as compared to the edges, and so it makes this central area a bit more see-through. And you can see it right here, but when you're looking under the microscope and you're using a microscope that has light, that light is coming up from the bottom and it's white light. When you shine white light through this cell, it looks like this, and it also looks like this, and this is the reason red blood cells look the way they do under the microscope. They have this central pallor, this central paleness, and normally it should be a third of the red blood cell, so no more than that. Anything more than that, we start worrying about something like anemia, meaning the cell has a little less hemoglobin than it's normally supposed to have. So now we're on part two, which is all about hemoglobin. And hemoglobin has this very, very important job of grabbing oxygen and letting it go. And if we break it down into its components, we can break, we can actually break down the word hemoglobin. So we have heme, we have globin, and I like to think the O is maybe for oxygen in there. But we'll start with heme. The heme part has two parts to it. One is this porphyrin ring here, which I've rendered out as this purplish ring, and inside the center is this silverish iron, and these put together is heme. And you can find a heme on a globin. So hemoglobin is made up of four globins. Globins are proteins. If you Google uh, globins, you'll see that they're often depicted as these like kind of chains and things like that. I looked up the word globin, which is, I think, coming from globe, which is a spherical object, so I picture them like this. So we have four globins, and on top of each globin we have that porphyrin ring, iron, and those put together, the porphyrin and the iron is heme, so each globin has a heme moiety. Now let's focus on these globins. Uh, hemoglobin is called a tetramer. It's a quad, it's a tetramer. Specifically, people refer to it as a heterotetramer, and that's because it's made up of different types of globins. Homotetramers are not normal, and you'll see that coming up. Someone on TikTok mentioned that my globins look like nerds, <laughs> and that is completely true. I totally see it. If you watch my videos on TikTok, if you watch them here, or if you take any of my more in-depth advanced courses, all the colors stay the same here. I just decided to color them this way because I think they're easier to see. Alpha in yellow, beta in orange, delta in blue, we have gamma in purple, we have epsilon in pink. We won't be talking a lot about epsilon or this next one, which is zeta. Those last two, epsilon and zeta, those are made for embryonic hemoglobins and we won't actually be talking about them today, but we can talk about them another time. By default, I think of these globins, they come as pairs, so they don't exist as single globins, they actually pair up. And then they like to pair up with different pairs, making them that heterotetramer. There are different types of globins forming this quad or tetramer and then different combinations of these different globin pairs lead to different types of hemoglobins. And we have different types of hemoglobins that show up at different parts of our lives. I will explain all of that in a moment. And this is the predominant type of hemoglobin you find in an adult. If we combine two deltas with two alphas, we get hemoglobin A2. And then if we combine two gammas with two alphas, we get the fetal hemoglobin, which is the predominant hemoglobin found in a fetus as well as a newborn. Hemoglobin F gets made around six weeks post-conception and it becomes the most dominant hemoglobin starting around three months. It's the most dominant hemoglobin at birth and until about two or four months and then hemoglobin A takes over so that by six months when um, hemoglobin is considered to be in the adult stage, we have predominantly A over F. Now, there is a lot of coordination that has to happen because if we're making different types of hemoglobins at different parts of our lives, it requires 
certain things getting turned on at a certain time, and that's where genetics comes into play. So I'm just gonna go over some normal genetics that go on in terms of making our globins. So we'll start with chromosome 16 here at the top. So chromosome 16, I made it look purplish here. We also need chromosome 11 for the other globin. So globins are made on these two chromosomes. And remember we have pairs of chromosomes, so we have to make a pair here. We get one chromosome from dad and one chromosome from mom. And on each of these chromosomes, there are genes or spots or locations where you can find the recipe to make something specific in the body. So on chromosome 16, where you see our white globins, these are the zeta globins I've rendered out, there is one gene per chromosome that makes zeta globin. So since we've got two chromosomes, we have two genes. Further down, we have our alpha globin genes. So this is what makes our alpha globins, and we actually have two genes on each chromosome, so we have a total of four genes that are involved in making alpha globins. I'm going to move down to chromosome 11. We have epsilon down here, one gene per chromosome. Then we have two gammas on each chromosome, so that gives us a total of four gammas total. Next, we have one gene for delta on each chromosome, and then lastly, one for beta. And this is how they are arranged. And so let's start making some hemoglobins. Let's start with the fetus. The fetus by definition, or a fetus, we're talking about nine weeks post-conception all the way to birth. Now, fetal hemoglobin is the predominant hemoglobin that you will find in the fetus, and you start making that at around week six. And then you really crank it up so that by month three, it is the dominant hemoglobin that you'll find in the fetus. So let's make fetal hemoglobin to start. So the first thing is we're gonna turn on the alpha globins that are gonna stay on for the rest of our lives. So here we are making a lot of yellow alpha globins. And from chromosome 11, we're making a lot of gamma. Gamma is really turned on. And so these two come together and make our fetal hemoglobin, which is two alphas and two gammas. If you checked the hemoglobin of a newborn, they're gonna mostly have hemoglobin F, but that's gonna go down. And then at six months, we have a switch. We now make more hemoglobin A, the adult type, than we do F. So let me show you that switch here. Again, alpha globin is on, ready to go. And so now we've really cranked on beta globin. That beta globin gene has been turned on. We've also turned on the delta globin gene. And that one is gonna be turned on after birth. And it's only turned on, I like to consider it slightly. We're not making that much of it. And then gamma globin is going to be turned on as well throughout the rest of our lives, but in a very, very small amount, just to give us a touch of fetal hemoglobin in our lives. So this is what is going on in adult. So if most of it's alpha globin that's being made and most of it's beta globin that's being made, we are gonna make a lot of hemoglobin A, which is two alphas and two betas put together. Now, in addition, we have been making other, other hemoglobins as well. So that delta globin is also gonna pair up with some alpha globins and give us our hemoglobin A2 here with the two blue deltas that are paired with the two yellow alphas and then that teeny bit of residual gamma that's always gonna be on will mix with the alpha globins and give us that fetal hemoglobin now, but in a much lower concentration than is, than is in the fetus. And so here is what we end up with if we put it all together. We can actually measure this out with a test that I'm gonna talk about in a bit. It's called hemoglobin electrophoresis. Here are our normal values. Hemoglobin A is gonna be about 95 to 98% of the total hemoglobin. Hemoglobin A2 is gonna be two to 3%, and then hemoglobin F is usually less than one. And I, of course, I try to remember it in an easier way. So I think about 97, two, and one. 97%-ish is hemoglobin A, 2% is A2, and then less than one is F. And hello again from the future, future editing Natalie here. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe so you can catch parts three, four, and five in a separate video to come. And comment down below. I love reading comments, especially when you leave me topics that you'd like me to cover in the future. 
It's your comments that inspire my next videos and let me know what people want me to cover next. And I will see you again soon for the second video.